changing the way we think. Research has shown, for example, that brains of literate and illiterate people differ in many ways. Nicholas Carr further suggested that the internet is fundamentally affecting how we think. The result scatters our attention and diffuses our concentration, he wrote. Whilst his thesis remains controversial, the brain does possess a neuroplasticity which allows it to develop new patterns of thought and form new neural pathways. However, the longer we use the new patterns of thought, the harder it is to go back, because the less used neural pathways become atrophied. Therefore, Carr suggests that the relationship of the mind and technology is dynamic. We change technology, and technology readapts our mind. In other words, we become the media that we have been shaped by in our culture. Therefore, given McLuhan's stance, it would seem that people are becoming more computer-like in their behavior and thinking. Slavoj Zizek said, I secretly think that reality exists so that we can speculate about it. Jonathan Miller said, The world is an emergent fiction, something that, like artists, we fabricate anew in every moment of our lives. Don't you see? All of this is a story. We all long for meaning, but there never was any. The only meaning is within stories. The task that religion once had has been fulfilled. The meaning that it was once pregnant with has been born out of it. Consciousness has integrated its former contents into itself as the form of its logical constitution. Even now, you are telling yourself a story through me, but you don't realize it. You think of stories of having some fundamental truth behind them, yet all they seek to do is further the mimetic influence. Zoroastrianism is a story, capitalism is a story, cellular biology is a story, history is his story. In fact, and in fiction, even you and me are a story. We are completely enveloped within narratives. Quantum mechanics is of course also a story, a contemporary story whose plasticity hints to you that the universe is a never-ending story, a hologram of information, a simulation of a simulation lost within its automythopoiesis, its own meta-narrative. What is the most horrifying thing that the scientific method cannot discover? That the nature of reality is unfalsifiable. Just as Bohm noted, nature will respond in accordance with the theory in which it is approached. If we are not aware that our theories are ever-changing forms of insight, then our vision will be limited. What is a theory but another story? Wolfgang Geigerich said, Everything we are dealing with is first and foremost linguistic, semiotic information, that man himself is language. Jacques Derrida said, there is nothing outside the text. Memes are the instruments by which we consciously or unconsciously create our reality. Some people like to anthropomorphize these semi-autonomous thought forms as angels, demons, ghosts, and so on. Yet they are purely objects of information. What is the etheric bridge between this world and the next? Information. In a very real sense, we are creating these mimetic entities just as they are creating us. There is a symbiosis, a mirroring. Just as the universe itself does not create, it co-creates. In these times we are living in, many people are awaiting some kind of messianic salvation or rapture or whatever, without realizing these are just narratives that they have been seduced into believing. Believing in something is in forming, i.e. shaping it. If enough people believe in the same story, then it may well develop into the next chapter of the story which we are co-creating. Do people think, for example, that civilization came about from one Neolithic man believing in it, or did it come about from a shared vision? Terence McKenna said, There is an obligation for everyone to carry their ideas clearly, because in the same way a gene must be replicated correctly, a meme must be correctly replicated or it will cause a pathological mutation. I suggest that if we, the voiceless, want to create a better reality together, then first of all we need to wake up and realize that we are living within the dream of stories. That realization leads to another two realizations. Firstly, the collective ego is dying. I maintain that Freud's death instinct is not just applicable to the individual, but also to society at large. Excessive egoism causes its own destructive turmoil and disintegration. It ends up consuming itself. What is the one thing the ego must always do? Convince itself that it is real, that there is a life after death, that its story never ends. Saving the world only makes sense to a dualistic mind. The only world the ego can try and save is its own. When the ego is dying, it reasserts itself with all its might. That is why, if you can't see the ego for what it is and let go and surrender it during a psychedelic or initiatory experience, then you will have a psychological train wreck. I do not wish to imply that the ego in itself is evil or bad, but rather is limited in its perspective and foresight. Yet the development of the ego has been a necessary part of the evolution of consciousness. 
The death of the ego can also be found within the mythopoiesis of contemporary culture, namely the grandiose apocalyptic genres of film and entertainment. The zombie, the robot and the alien all archetypically represent the other that we have long disavowed. In some sense, one might look at these mythical images as three of our possible future evolutionary paths. Which would you rather be? Maybe you can play as all three, if you get what I'm saying. The second realization is that if language is what is creating our reality, then we have been far too naive about the power we have given to corporations, political, religious, scientific and academic institutions, as well as the media, all of which of course are the high castles of the paternal ego. Astute observers will notice, for example, that the news never claims to report the truth, but rather simply manufactures news stories to propagate. As Walter Truett Anderson writes, as more people suspect that reality can be created, the world becomes a theatre. How do you take the power back after you have woken up from your socially constructed reality? By taking responsibility for your language, by telling a different story, by refusing to carry culturally sanctioned memes, by walking away, by shunning them, by shaming them, by satirising them, by rendering their symbolic power inert, a null pointer. Buckminster Fuller said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Why is that so difficult? Why don't we do anything? It's because we will only ever be moved by the immediacy of the situation, which by and large is kept at bay by the veneer of civilization and the media circus. We see and hear about disasters in the news, but they are on the other side of the world and they don't affect us. Here's some sports news instead. The endemic exposure to violence in our culture desensitizes us from our own self-destruction. The suffering of others takes on an unreality, without which we could never continue to perpetuate it. Another reason is that it's easier to follow the script that someone else hands to you. After all, it's not that bad, is it? Or is it? Until people step outside their cages, they will never know, and that is exactly what keeps them there. The fear of knowing otherwise, the uncertainty it brings. The irony is that there is no security in life. But that's not what the financial and insurance companies want you to think. You can buy, quote unquote, security. You can, quote unquote, protect your investment. Who are you behind the mask? Who are you when you're not telling your story? That's all you have to ask. That's all you have to remember. To remember. Who are you? Really? Really? I am just a figment of your imagination.